Hey everyone and welcome to the channel. If you're a Photolab user or thinking about becoming a Photolab user in today's video, I'm going to share with you six different things that you just might not know about Photolab. Now, of course, as soon as I say this, I realize this is going out to a wide audience. And of course, some of you are going to know some of these things. And in fact, some of you might know all of these things. But I think there might be things that are less known aspects of Photolab. So I wanted to put this video together. This all started when I was just having a wee play with this image that you can see on the screen right now. Just took it a few days ago. And as I was going, I was thinking, oh, that's an interesting thing. That could make a tip. That could make a tip. And before I knew it, I had a little cluster of tips. So I thought I would go ahead and do this video up. Now you can notice that this is cropped in an X-Pan sensor sort of way. I have to say, sadly, this was not taken on the free Hasselblad that I got sent because my channel's too small. I did not get a free Hasselblad. So this is just taken on my Nikon camera, but I've been watching heaps of YouTubers who do have the free Hasselblads um, and they're taking lots of pictures in X-Pan and I've been really enjoying that, that, uh, that aspect ratio. So here we have, here we have my Nikon um, version of X-Pan. So anyway, I digress. Let's jump into the tips. So tip number one is about setting white point. Now in some other software, such as Lightroom or you know, whatever else, there's often a whites slider that you can play with. In Photolab there isn't, but you can still absolutely impact your whites. And that's just gonna be done down here in the tone curve tool. And I've already got some whites adjustment here, but they're in the luminance channels. Just when I click over there, you'll see. So in order to impact the whites, you're going to drag this slider here in from the side to lessen this gap, which is going to change the relationship of whites in the image. So that's what's at the 232. So if I drag that back, you can see that just flattens out a little bit. And if you watch the histogram as well, you can see that pulling out to the side there. And that's just, just how you're gonna impact your whites. And actually I'll just leave that on 230. That's just absolutely fine. Now you can see on this curve, I've actually done a couple of other adjustments just to tweak things out a little bit. Um, but th those are not part of the whites adjustment. The whites adjustment is just the, the part where I'm sliding in here. That said, sometimes when you do your whites adjustment, you then want to tweak other things. And, and so I've just done a couple of small adjustments there. Right, so I will come back to the tone curve in a little while, but for now I'm going to come up here to my color space and I want to talk a little bit about soft proofing for tip number two. So if I come down here at the bottom in the color space, there is soft proofing, turn that on, and it's currently set to sRGB. So I often do this for a couple of reasons. The first one you can see immediately is I've got my soft proofing set to have the background be white or pretty close to white. And this I do because it changes your perception of the brightness of the image. So it helps me to see the image in a different way. In my opinion, lots of times if we put images up on Facebook or something and suddenly they look way darker than we thought they did, it's because of that. Because Facebook, a lot of the times, depends on your settings, will come out with a, a white background. And that changes the way you see the brightness values in your image. So I like to go to soft proofing uh, to get this background. And even beyond that, I also like to make the image a little bit smaller because again, I can just see it in a slightly different way. I see it more as the tones than anything else. And of course, in the settings, you can change how the background displays both here and generally. So if I come to edit and preferences, that'll be different if you're on a Mac, of course, and I come to display, I get the opportunity to change my background color. So for my soft proofing, I've got it as light as it will go. For my main image browser, it's currently quite dark. And in fact, I was thinking to myself as I was preparing to do this video, I'm actually going to lighten that up a bit because I think it'll just in general help. I, I do like having the slightly darker background when I'm editing lots of times, just, just easier on the eyes. But uh, this, I think this will just help my perception. So I'm just going to bounce that up a little bit. Now, tip number three is also in soft proofing. And it's sort of a perfect example of why soft proofing is a thing that you might want to think about. So if I turn off soft proofing for a minute, and here we can see my slightly lighter background than I had before because I altered it. Um, and we look up at the histogram. Now, this image is being displayed using DxO's you know, image pipeline. It's in their, let me scroll way up, DxO wide gamut color space. And that impacts the histogram over here. So the histogram is all tidy and in place. 
But you notice if you watch that histogram, when I turn on sRGB, so if I'm exporting for the web, that that shifts, that all of a sudden my red channel is sort of pushing all the way to the right edge here. And in fact, it was even further than that. So this is a perfect example of turning it on to see how that's impacting your histogram when it does that shift, because there's just less space for the colors in the sRGB color space. And this image is actually already corrected a little. So this is the point when I'll jump back to the curves. So if I come back here and I come to the red channel, you can see that I've already brought the red channel down a little bit. Now, I just realized this was on 232. There we go. That's done the difference. So I was still up against the edge um, uh, over here, but it's because when I was tweaking with the white point, I was less precise and I left it on 230. And that's sort of the, the difference it can make. But anyway, this point is about how you can impact. So if I'm over here and I look at this all the way up, you can see that's really that's, that's how it is by nature. It's jamming right up against the right side. And it's not too big a thing, but if you come over here and turn on your highlight warning, you can see that there's a bit of a highlight warning there. So that's sort of showing you what is um, blowing out in the red there. So, But we can impact that, and I guess I can leave the highlight warning on. So I've come to my red channel, which is the one that's blowing out. And in the highlights, I'm just going to bring those down a bit. And there's almost gone, almost gone, gone. Lovely. So that's in there now. Now you'll see a different, a second point here, because of course, if I don't have this point and, and that point's not there by nature, so let me delete that. So if that happens and I pull my reds down, it's bringing, you see, can you see the blue line? That's sort of your baseline. And so it's bringing reds out of heaps of the image, particularly everything from about this point up, it's taking reds out, which is changing the overall um, feel of the image quite a bit beyond what I wanted. So in order to compensate for that, what I've just done is I've clicked in around here, you know, it's not an exact science and so what I'm seeing here is that it's currently at 189, what ordinarily would have been 195. So that's that's displaying to us the, how much it's under. So I'm just going to come up here and use this sort of precise tool to bring that back up to 195. So in essence, there's no change in red channel until we get up to the to the um, highest level of highlights and then it kind of eases them off so that they don't blow out and you can see that represented here but the only way to get that level of precision is to have it in srgb so you can see what that srgb histogram is going to look like and then you can massage it for your output now my next tip is about the style toning space and it's you know if you're in something like Lightroom, they've got that ability to color grade with their three little wheels where they can um, impact the shadows, the midtones, and the highlights, and you can set sort of color tone within those. And just to point out that, honestly, it's not quite as elegant. It's a little bit of an older tool. I mean, this has been around for way longer than the color grading tools in Lightroom have been. So I think maybe this one probably needs a bit of an update, but there is some functionality here for us to do that, but it doesn't hit the midtones is the only thing. As we We've got highlights and shadows, and then we can we can show where the balance is. You know what's going to be considered. So that's going to go more more towards the blues, which is my shadows, and that's going to make more of the image be highlighty. Um, but just going to leave that in the middle. So essentially, what I've done, and you can choose different things. Is there are some some base settings there that you can choose, but I've just gone down to custom and I've chosen a hue of 30, which is kind of a, a sunsetty kind of hue. I've increased the saturation a little bit um, and then, you know, play with the intensity to find, because obviously it can be very crazy. Um, but if you drag the intensity down, you can find that sweet spot. And this does allow you to make a big impact to the image. So let me just show you what this is doing. So basically I've got um, sort of a, a warmth on the highlights and a cool tone. Again, just a little bit of it on the um, shadows. And here's what kind of a difference it makes to the image, which is a pretty big difference. All right, so my next tip is over here in the local adjustments. So I've already got a few local adjustments on. If I just turn those off, it gives you a sense for the difference that's going on there. But so tip number one is around what if you want to apply some effects to the entire image? So you basically want to have an image adjustment layer as a separate thing. So if you take the control line, you can quite easily do this. Now, 
I'll just pop another one on for argument's sake, so I'll just go plus. I'm still on control line. Um, just literally a matter of put it quite close to the bottom, drag that down. Now, now you're impacting the entire image because everything is being included. Everything's in the in the red, so to speak. So I'll just go ahead and delete that one. So this is my control line up here, and I haven't done much with this. I you know probably could have done this outside of um, things, but I have just done a little bit of color work here so I've just increased the saturation and the luminance on the oranges and I have slightly increased the saturation on the blues. The biggest reason I might do this and I don't do this often but every now and again I do is if I want to make a few different adjustments and then have the ability to slide the opacity and you can see here that I have done that. The opacity for this layer is currently on 52 so that was with with everything going and I just decided to take a bit of the intensity out. And now that I'm looking at that, I'm gonna not take it as far down as 50. I might take it to 70. So it's when I want to make some adjustments and then have that ability to just um, play with the opacity, decide what my level is going to be with multiple adjustments all at once. So that is the biggest reason that I do that one. And finally, I have another video about this one, but I'll just include it here because I think it's a, it's a good tip. If I come to this one, that's a graduated filter, just a straight up um, grad filter, and it's on the sky. And if I turn that off, you can see that there is not very much color in that sky at all. So this is a great trick to add a little bit of color to the sky, and it's simply using white balance. If I come down here, I have used the white balance tool and I have dropped that. I think it was around 5,300, so I've dropped it to 4,300. I brought, I've introduced more blues. And when I did the, you don't always need to do this, but you sometimes do need to play with tint as well. So in this instance, I also had to um, shift a bit of magenta out and take it a little bit more towards green uh, to get something that was pleasing for me. So great tip to add just a little bit of color to skies that have gone a little bit dull, which I find happens quite late in the day quite a lot. And I don't want to oversaturate it, but I do want to have a little bit of color because there was color there for my eyes. And then finally, a bit of a bonus tip, and that is don't forget that you have a duplicate option. So if you, uh, you know, I made this one for the sky and I wanted to apply a little bit of it to the water down below. So I duplicated that and then I come in and I just pull that down there towards the bottom, flip it around this way, and, and that's being doubly applied now, so that's that's why that looks so atrocious, because I just did another one for example point. But basically, just hit that duplicate button, drag it to the new place, flip it around how you like, and then you've got the same um, settings, basically. So you can reproduce what you've just done in a different area. Now, I'm going to delete that one, because that's, again, doubling up and not looking nice. So that is it for my tips. I'll leave you with one bonus tip. Right now I'm in my local space and you know my, my, my local world is selected. Anytime you have a tool selected, remember, at least on Windows, you can press escape and now it is out of that tool. That is a black border currently because I've got my highlight um, clipping warning on. But anyway, pressing escape inside any tool will make it go away. So hopefully you've gotten at least one new tip out of that, or at least a reminder of something that you knew about, but you'd forgotten about. If you've got any more tips that you think would be helpful for people, uh, drop them in the comments, let me know. Also, if you already knew all of them, drop that in the comments. I'd be curious how many people already were onto all of these. I do, you know, I get it. I get that there's a, a wide a wide breadth of people who will be watching and a wide breadth of experience levels. So, But hopefully you got something from the video. With that, I'll say thanks for watching and I'll talk again soon. Bye for now.